Oh gosh. Surprise. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm back. Kind of. Not really. Do I get to say that I'm back if the whole reason that I'm back on YouTube is for me to tell you that I'm actually not back yet? <laughs> So this might be a surprise. Um, I have talked about it a little bit on Instagram. I made like a little community post on YouTube. I don't know how many people see those. Um, but yeah, I had knee surgery. This is all very difficult. Um, setting up a tripod and getting everything framed up and cleaned up and, and whatnot. It, on crutches, it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, and so that's... Uh, you know, a good reason for why I haven't been on YouTube. The other other reason obviously being that I can't do anything. Yeah, I'm on crutches and uh, so life has kind of been put on hold, especially when it comes to the homestead. But yeah, I thought I would just get on here and uh, kind of let you guys know what happened. And uh, so I had surgery at the end of August on my knee. I had hurt my knee in March. If you guys follow my channel, you guys saw that I hurt my knee and I've talked about it a little bit already. So I won't go too in depth today, but basically I just genetically have bad knees. Um, they are built wrong and that makes them really prone to dislocating. And I grew up with this. Um, I basically grew into my knees when I was about 10 years old. Um, I grew up ballet dancing and cheerleading and stuff like that and when I was like 10 to 12 ish I basically had to give all that up because they just would not stay in my body and uh, That's when I switched to riding horses and I rode horses competitively all through high school and uh, College and everything that turned into my sport. I hadn't dislocated my knees either one of them since college when that happened in March. And in March, I just tripped. I was cleaning up back behind the house um, before the tractor got here, which you can see all of that in my two year recap video. If you're not familiar with the channel or you're not caught up on everything, I just tripped over the tripod. I was I picked it up to go walk it somewhere else and tripped over it because it sticks out a little bit. And that simple trip um, dislocated my knee. That's how easy it is for me to dislocate my knees. And so I got all better from that and kind of got to thinking that it would probably be a good idea to go see a doctor about it, see if there's anything that can be done. Cause the last time I had seen a doctor was in high school. In high school, they said it was gonna be a six month recovery time minimum per knee. Um, and so I kind of had that in the back of my head for all these years thinking I don't have time for this. You know, I, I was in college and then I went straight from college to Germany from Germany to my job um, and then from my job right into the van. And so all of these places, I was not in a position to have somebody care for me. I was off on my own doing my own thing, um, which I'm still doing now I'm across the country from my parents. But at least now I have a house for people to stay while they take care of me and everything. So I thought, okay, well maybe this is possible. So I went to see a doctor. They did some MRIs and they said probably a month to be walking, three months for sports. And I thought, wow, that's great. A month to be walking, that's a, that's a pretty not major surgery. Um, at the time it was still summer, it was still 120 degrees. I was like, hurry up and get this puppy booked so that, you know, I'm not doing anything anyways because it's too hot. I can sit here in bed and recover and then fall will get here, the, the nice weather will get here and I can just hit the ground running with all the projects that got put on hold. Because I actually have two projects that I have hours of footage of. They're really big projects you guys are going to be really excited for. Um, but I don't want to spoil them. You know, I'm really excited for them and I'm excited for them to be finished and I'm excited for you guys to see them um, because they're really like pushing me and what I have experience with and what I'm comfortable with. Um, they're big changes. And so the moral of the story is they didn't get finished before the surgery, but I thought no big deal because the surgery, I'll be back at it in a month. And yeah, I, I, 
I've had some drama with all of this. Since I have nothing to share with you guys about the homestead, I thought I would do a little story time with you guys and share with you the drama, if that's okay. Okay, so going back to the beginning. So basically I had the one appointment and then they went to submit everything with insurance and get all of that taken care of. And it went really fast. My insurance was like, we don't care, go for it. All of a sudden I had a, a surgery scheduled in like two weeks. And so when they were calling me to schedule the surgery, I was like, I mean, I kind of don't know what's happening. <laughs> like, I know at a high level they want to do this and that, but like, I don't know exactly what that entails. Like. I don't know, like I have a brace. I don't know if that will be sufficient, like all that kind of stuff. And she's like, okay, well, we'll set you up a pre-surgery appointment. And that surgery, pre-surgery appointment ended up being the day before my surgery. So I, um, like for work, for example, I was like telling my boss, I was like, I have a surgery, but I have no idea how long I need to take off for it. And I won't know until the day before because that's when my pre-surgery appointment is. The doctor was literally on vacation between the appointment being scheduled and me having my pre-surgery appointment. So luckily my mom was able to come down and she came down like a week or so before the surgery. So we had, we got to have some good little mother-daughter bonding time and, and see the sights and everything. And the day of the surgery, I was like pretty early in the morning, obviously like anesthesia and stuff, couldn't eat, couldn't drink, got down there, was in the waiting room, got pulled back put in um, the little bed, changed in the hospital gown and everything. And then the gal who's supposed to do all the pre-surgery stuff is literally following a sticky note, a handwritten sticky note on what to do. Cause she's like, I'm sorry, I don't usually work back here. Um, I'm usually on the post-operative side as opposed to the pre. Um, so she literally didn't know what she was doing at all and was like, oh, oops, I forgot this, and oh, oops, I forgot that, and oh, I'm supposed to be doing this, and I think I'm doing it right. Like typing on the computer and all the questions she's supposed to ask and all that kind of stuff, and I'm like, um, this is my first surgery. I don't know what it's supposed to be like, you know, uh, but this doesn't give me a high level of confidence. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little worried. Um, but then some other gal came over and was like started holding her hand and and you know guiding her through it and everything i was like okay phew then they went to go do the iv and they like to do the ivs in the back of the hand uh and i have zero veins only had an iv i think one other time in my life and they also really struggled to get it they had to tie it really tight and or wrap in it and they used this like cold like if you had like a can of air to clean your um keyboard off they they use that and apparently that helps things stand out or or i guess probably constricts the skin so it sucks closer to the vein i don't know um but they had like a specialist gal come over and she literally like she didn't talk beforehand obviously a lot i mean she kind of explained what she was doing but after it was in she was like wow, yeah, that was pretty difficult. I, I basically just had to guess where the vein was and I, I guessed right. I mean, she got it the first try, but she was like, yeah, I basically just had to guess. <laughs> like, I'm like, ugh, <laughs> great. That wasn't fun. It was quite painful. I mean, I'm sure it's not fun in general to get an IV placed, but I guess is it just little itty bitty veins and everything? It was, wasn't fun. But yeah, then the, then the um, anesthesiologist came by and he was like, okay, so we're putting two nerve blocks in. One of them, and okay, T, T for time. Um, this knee doesn't bend up high enough. So I'm going to show you everything on this knee, but that's the knee that got the surgery on. So he goes, one, one of the nerve blocks is going in the side of the knee. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're putting a needle in my knee? No effing way. I don't know if I can do this. Um, especially because I'm like sweating from what happened on the, with the IV. But he was like, oh, we put the topical numbing on and then they use an ultrasound machine so that they can see in the knee so they know exactly where they're putting the needle and everything. Um, he's like, it's not bad, I promise. And he was right, it really wasn't bad. I basically didn't feel it. That one, your your knee is bent and you're like, hold, you know, that you're, if you were unconscious, your knee would wanna flop over to the side and stuff, so you're awake for it. Um, and then they put me under and then they did a nerve block up in the hip, right where my underwear sits, you know, like right in the crease of the hip, there's a, you, and I could see exactly where it was cause you can see where the needle went in afterwards. But I was unconscious for that. So I don't remember anything after that. They did the needle um, in the knee, put me under, 
did the surgery and then I woke up, I came to, and I came to really fast. Um, cause the one other time I've been sedated, it took me forever to wake up, but I think they gave me something to wake me up. Um, because I think they needed the beds. They, they seemed like they were in a hurry. And the first thing I remember saying is I'm in pain. Like it hurts. So the way that the nerve block works is that like the one in the knee got from the knee down, the, my whole foot, everything from the knee down was numb. But then the one on the inside on my hip numbed the inside of my of my leg and the whole outside of my leg was fine. Like it could feel it, everything like over here was not numb. It was just the inside of my leg that was numb. And so, yeah, I woke up and I was like, yeah, I, I can feel pain and that doesn't seem right. You would think that they did the numbing so that like anything that they were gonna work on or that would have been affected by it would be still under the nerve block. So I, I'm like, hey, I feel pain. And the nurses kind of snottily were like, yeah, you just had surgery. Of course, you're going to feel pain. And I'm like, I don't know any better. Like, it doesn't make sense to me, but okay, whatever. And they pretty much instantly were like, can you get dressed? And I'm like, can you give me a second? I just woke up. I don't know what's going on here. And I'm like, and I'm, like I'm hungry. Like, is there any food? And they're like, oh, um... And they go wandering around and they come back with a couple little baby graham cracker squares. They're like, here, have this. And I'm like, so you weren't planning on feeding me afterwards. Make sure like I'm not nauseous after the anesthesia or anything. Like, like I only got food because I asked for it. And, and even then it was just a couple little graham crackers. Um, and I'm like, I'm thirsty. And they're like, Ugh. and they go get me a bottle of water and I drink a bottle of water and everything. And I'm like, and then they're like, can you get dressed? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Let me go get dressed. And and by this time, like I'm in the brace and the brace that I have, I it's in the car right now and I don't want to go get it. I'll put a photo or a stock photo or something. It's like metal and it locks into place and your leg is locked straight. So I'm like still like from the anesthesia trying to get dressed and they're like hiking my pants up and everything, you know, because um, like I ha I can't bend a leg, you know, trying to get dressed and, and they're trying to keep me off the leg, obviously. Um, and so they plop me in a wheelchair and take me outside and I'm we're sitting there waiting for my mom to come with the car and and the nurse is like small talking with me, asking me like how far it is for me to get home. And I'm like, yeah, it's like an hour and a half. And I'm like, can I go to the bathroom first? Like, and she's like, oh, do you need to go? I was like, yeah, that'd be great. And she's like, oh yeah, it's probably better if you go to the bathroom here, you know, than stop at like a McDonald's post-surgery to use their bathroom or something, you know? So she wheels me back inside so I can use the bathroom. And so then I get wheeled back out and my mom's there and she picks me up and we get dumped me in the car. And as she put, she's putting me in the car, the nurse says to my mom, make sure she takes her um, medicine, her pain reliever when she gets home. And she goes, what did they give her again? I'm coherent through all of this. I go, oh, they gave me Percocet. She goes, yeah, make sure she takes that. As soon as she gets home, the nerve block's gonna wear off. You know, she said, you, you know, it's an hour and a half to get home. Um, by the time you guys get home, the nerve block's gonna start wearing off a, a few hours later and you wanna be out ahead of it with the pain medicine so that there's no chance for the pain to get bad and then the pain medicine has to chase and catch up to it. And my mom's like, well, but wait, that's not what they said inside. Like the, cause apparently in the waiting room, somebody came to talk to her about what she was supposed to be doing to take care of me. And they told me her something else. And they also gave her a paper at that time. And the paper said something different from what she said, so basically there's like three different care instructions. For example, with showering there were, and with the brace and everything, like the paper said, like I'm weight bearing, I don't need the brace. The nurse said, I'm non weight bearing, I need to leave the brace on, I can't shower, sponge bath. And then the nurse that came out to the car was like, um, no, you can shower, you can take the brace off to shower. My mom and I are sitting there going, what are we actually supposed to be doing? We leave and on the way home, I'm and I'm hungry still. I had two little things of crackers. So we go through McDonald's drive through By the time I'm like, I don't know, a half hour away from home, I'm like holding my knee going, ah, like I'm in pain, sweating, like, ah. And I realize 
where the pain is coming from is that my brace has these brackets and they have a curve to them. So they're like supposed to contour around your leg. And instead of that, it's fitted so that it's digging into my leg. And I'm like, great. So they misfitted my brace and I'm in all this pain kind of beside myself and I break the brace like, because I'm trying to hold it off, hold the pressure off of my leg. And in doing so, it's a piece of plastic and I break it. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Um, but at that point, it's been on there for like two hours, we'll say, because it was on before I woke up. I get home and I crutch in and I get into bed and I get my leg all propped up and I'm like, oh, I'm in, I'm in pain um, from how this brace was fitting incorrectly, but I was told not to move the brace or remove the brace or anything. It's locked. It's got my leg locked in the position it needs to be to heal. Um, so I just take my Percocet. I've never taken any opioids before. Um, and I know they're really controversial. Half of you probably are watching this going, no, don't take them. Oh my gosh. But at that point, I'm like, I'm in pain. So I take the Percocet. It's a five milligram Percocet. And about an hour into having it, I have heart palpitations. I am sweating. I'm talking with my mom a million miles an hour. I'm like on crack. I'm like, blah, 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 like ah. this doesn't feel right. So we call the doctor. And so this is how I find out. And this is I, I almost wouldn't have chosen to do this surgery at this hospital if I knew that this was going to be the way it was. And if the other hospital had a different method of it. Um, but this is how I find out that I can't call my doctor. I call the hospital and the hospital has just general receptionists and the receptionists take a note and then they pass it on to my doctor's nurse and my doctor's nurse will call me back and actually talk to me. And if she doesn't know the answer to these questions, which she never does, she will then hang up the phone for me, talk to the doctor whenever he has a second and call me back. So it's three separate phone calls for me to get any sort of an answer on anything. And it takes hours. So I'm sitting here thinking I might be having an allergic reaction because my dad actually is allergic to a different opioid. What do I do? And I'm waiting for them to call me back and tell me what to do. Um, and like an hour later, maybe two, it all kind of goes away and I'm exhausted at this point, I fall asleep. Wake back up, they call me back and they're like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you, just don't take anymore. And I'm like, well, but I'm in pain, what am I supposed to take? And they're like, well, just just take um, ibuprofen and acetaminophen. You know, basically this is the max amount of acetaminophen you can take in a 24 hour period, alternate between the two of them and that should be okay. The doctor doesn't think you actually really needed the opioids. It's It was just there for you if you wanted it. And I'm like, first of all, that's news to me that they were there if I wanted them because you prescribed it to me as if it was necessary. The nerve block hasn't worn off yet. And like I said, the gal who put me in the car was like, oh, tonight basically it'll wear off and it hasn't worn off yet. So first of all, my leg is entirely numb. I could barely get in the door coming in from the car because my leg is just dead weight and I'm like trying to like hoist it over the threshold. <laughs> um, and by that time, you know, I have to go to the bathroom. And so I'm like trying to go to the bathroom and my leg's just dead weight and everything from the nerve block. Uh, and so I'm like just struggling because it's just like, it's almost like cartoonish that I'm just like flopping this leg around, um, trying to like not trip over it and everything. So yeah, I'm, I'm like the nerve block is still there. I still can't move it, but I'm in pain because of how the brace was digging into my leg on the part of my leg that wasn't numb. Um, so I start taking the regular pain meds and it, it kind of works and it's fine. It, it gets over the pain, like gets it controlled. I mean, it's not gone, but it's controlled and it's fine. I spend the next basically two days waiting for this nerve block to wear off. And Google is my friend at this point because apparently there's kind of two nerve blocks. There's one that lasts like eight hours ish. And then there's another one that lasts like 24 hours ish. And uh, clearly the nurse who told me it was wearing off this evening didn't know that I had a 24 hour plus nerve block in and not like the one that only lasts eight hours. So that's great because, you know, if she had known that I had the 24 hour nerve block, I probably wouldn't have taken the Percocet and had this reaction to a Percocet. Um, because when the nerve block did start to wear off, I was in pain. Um, and I did start taking the Percocet again. 
Um, and that first pill was like, oh my gosh, like I waited to take it. So it was the middle of the day in case I needed to go to an emergency room in case I had that reaction again. Um, and I didn't, I didn't have that reaction again. And I never did. I took a lot of Percocet over the next like handful of days and I never had that reaction again. So I can only assume that I was actually having a reaction between meds that I was given for the anesthesia or for, for waking me up from the anesthesia and the Percocet. Like basically I took that Percocet too soon. Um, when in reality I was just doing exactly what they told me to do. So, so anyways, yeah, the nerve block started to wear off around the two day mark. I started taking the Percocet um, and the Percocet just as prescribed, it was five milligrams every six hours, wasn't cutting it. Calling the doctor like five times, asking him, what am I supposed to be doing? It's not, it's not working. Can I take it more often? Blah, blah, blah. And the doctor basically like, I never talked to him directly, uh, but he was more or less like, you're fine. So it, it took a number of days for them to believe me that I was in pain. And then they prescribed a 10 milligram Percocet. So I took that. It's still like it would work, but then it would wear off before the six hour mark. So it would still, I was still in pain. Um, days later, I'm still trying to get on top of the pain management. So I finally, I, I'm again playing phone tag with them. Finally, they say it's okay for me to take that 10 milligram Percocet every four hours. Because again, I'm Googling and apparently Percocet has a half-life of like three hours. So by six hours, it's more or less out of your system. And that was my problem is that it's like, I needed all of that in the system for it to stay on top of the level of pain that I was in. So anyways, they told me I could take it every four hours, that would be fine. And so I finally was on like a pain regimen that I could, that, that was actually working for the pain by taking 10 milligram Percocet every four hours. So that was days of me just laying in bed in agony. <laughs> a really positive, really great experience. I, I just, I had such a great time, if you couldn't tell. So by the end of the week, um, I guess the doctor was sick and tired of hearing phone calls from me multiple times every day over all of this. And I get a call from his nurse saying, hey, would you be available for an appointment at 11? And it was like nine. And I was like, um, sure, I can get in the car. I might be a little late. And she goes, well, he wants to see you. Um, so like, if you're late, don't worry about it. But if you can get in the car and come down, that'd be great. At that point, like the pain was managed, but only if I was laying still. Um, so getting in the car and driving down the washboard and like, the, like sitting in the car as opposed to laying in bed, like it was like not a fun ride down. Um, I, I like the pain meds were not enough to keep me comfortable on the way down and back. I see the doctor and he basically sits in the room and he's like, so what do you want to see me for? I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you called me. And I'm like, I have been calling you. That's correct. But I mean, I kind of have been getting answers playing phone tag with your nurse, but he's like, well, I had a note saying that you wanted to see me. And I'm like, I had a phone call from your nurse two hours ago saying to get my butt down here. And so I did. Where the communication was crossed, I don't know. And he was like, well, I've been, I've just been getting all these notes from all these phone calls from you um, saying that you thought you were dying and stuff like that. And so I just, you know, and, and that you wanted to see me. So here I am. And I was like, and I, it took me a second. I was like, when did I say I was dying? I never said I was dying. And then I was like, oh, you're talking about the reaction I had to the Percocet on the very first day. Yeah, like I, I did have a reaction to it, but I'm not having a reaction to it now. So cross that off your list. Not a problem anymore. He's like, yeah, well, you keep talking about how much pain you're in and all that kind of stuff. I was like, yeah, well, here, let me show you the bru it, it, the brace was fitting like this. Look, you can see how I broke the brace, but it was fitting like this and all that kind of stuff. And he, But that's not a problem anymore. I broke the brace. I'm on pain meds now, like I can't feel it. Like, again, not a problem, cross it off your list. I woke up today thinking everything's hunky-dory and then you called me down here. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe you think something happened wrong, like something went wrong in the surgery because I shouldn't be in this much pain or whatever and you need to see me, you know, take an x-ray or an MRI or see it or whatever, maybe it's infected, I don't know. I'm thinking there's something wrong because you're calling to have to see me 
So that was a really not fun appointment because I'm in pain and I'm snippy and I like could not care less at this point that I'm being kind of a bitch to be honest because he's being a bitch back to me. He literally said, and my mom was a witness, he said, well, I do this surgery on 15 year old girls all the time and they don't have any problems. And he said it pretty much in that exact tone. Like, and I was like, see and red at that point. So all of these phone calls that I was having and the hesitancy to give me more meds and all that kind of stuff is because you think I'm just being melodramatic. You think that I'm just this little girl who can't handle pain and is a hypochondriac. And anyways, I, I could go on about this for a very long time, but I think you guys get the point. I left from that appointment very upset. I just happened to look into my two week follow up being with his physician's assistant, um, who is much nicer and much better communicator and everything. Basically, by the time they got the meds sorted out, I was kind of to the point where I didn't need the meds. I was only on that 10 milligram Percocet for a couple of days. And then I just went off of it on my own. I still have some, I didn't, didn't even take all of the, all of what I had. And just because you hear nightmare horror stories about opioids, Obviously, I'm not a doctor. I'm just speaking my own personal experience. The amount of opioids I was on, I didn't feel anything. I was perfectly um, conscious. I wasn't floaty, didn't feel good, um, really didn't make me tired. I, I mean, right after I took it, maybe sometimes I would take a nap, but I didn't have to. Like, they didn't make me feel in any way, shape, or form a way that would be addicting to me. Personally, again, all personal experience, it, there was no high that I would be chasing or anything. Um, and then from a pain management side, uh, I didn't have a problem stopping them. I, I went to sleep, woke up the next morning, didn't have enough pain to warrant taking a pill and, I, and so I just didn't. The rest of that um, kind of first two week period is pretty non-eventful. You know, I just got up to go to the bathroom and otherwise I was on bed rest. Um, the thing that I did notice and that I was worried about and, uh, was glad that I had a two week appointment for was I couldn't lift my leg. Um, and I wasn't sure if that was because of the nerve block, if something had gone wrong with the nerve block that was in my hip. So I got to the two week appointment, spoke with the, um, physician's assistant and he assured me that that was, um, no problem. It was normal that the um, graft that they did um, for the reconstruction was in the quad muscle. And basically my brain knew that um, and it was trying to protect it. Don't, don't activate this muscle because it's injured basically. And that that would resolve. And from that two week appointment, they scheduled me into physical therapy. And um, so I went into a physical therapist and um, got evaluated. But that more or less was my experience with the surgery. So in terms of what the surgery was, there was kind of two parts to it. Um, and I actually didn't really learn exactly what happened until my appointment yesterday, which was again with the physician's assistant, basically for you guys to have an idea. But again, on the good knee, I had um, little baby dots of where cameras went in and stuff and then two big incisions. Um, basically all, they went in and they um, kind of cut so it was, would relax and it would loosen. And then they went and did a reconstruction on this side. And basically the goal of all of it is to pull my kneecap more central. Basically it was already sitting halfway outside of my knee. And so it was really easy to dislocate because it was like already halfway there. And now it's sitting right in the center of my knee. So it would take a lot more distance to travel for it to dislocate. So the releasing side is like all with robots and stuff, teeny tiny little, little holes. The side that they lengthened was like not major at all. Like um, it's just little micro tears to um, heal. The reconstruction side though is like kind of a bigger deal. I don't think it's too graphic um what exactly they did but if you're a little bit squeamish there's drills involved um so if you're squeamish about the idea of drills um skip skip forward a little bit so basically on the reconstruction side they have a cadaver tendon it's like this you know long tendon imagine actually i have yarn here imagine this is the tendon 
and they made a slit like a cut in the quad and then they go and they slip it through like that so imagine this is the quad muscle and then on the femur they take a drill and they drill all the way through to the other side so there's a little hole here where the drill comes out the other side and basically they take this part so that it's like doubled over and they thread it through the tube and then there's a piece on the other side that like pops open and um it's then like a stopper like imagine like a nut basically so it can't go back through the hole because it's too big at this point it's got a big stopper and that's made out of titanium and so basically the graft goes from the quad around through and then is anchored back on the other side as much as i think it's cool it also kind of freaks me out so <laughs> i don't think about it too much um but they showed me the mri yesterday and like to see the hole all the way through and all that kind of stuff was like Ugh. that's what it looks like in there um but he said the hole in the bone they actually it fuses back together it'll take longer um to do that but it actually fuses back together and and everything so yeah that's exactly what they did lengthen this side reconstructed this side yanked that kneecap over so it's more centered so like i said i went to the two-week appointment i was like hey i can't lift my leg and he was like yeah that's fine um and so i went to the physical therapy told the physical therapist he's like yep yeah, that's fine you're right in the thick of it. Um, everything's still really swollen and everything. We'll get you into physical therapy and, and, and it'll all work itself out. So the first physical therapist I saw sucked, just straight up sucked. That first appointment, we essentially did nothing um, because he would go to do something and I'd ask questions. I'm like, oh, is it supposed to hurt here? Am I supposed to feel this? What, what, what's this supposed to feel like? And he didn't have the answer to any of those questions. And so he wouldn't do it like because he, he was scared, which wasn't helpful. So we essentially did nothing for that first appointment. Um, so it was a full like I was at the end of week four before I even had a real physical therapy appointment. I got in with a gal. She's pretty great. She has like a lifetime of experience. She's a bit older. So when I would ask her, oh, I feel pain here. Oh, it feels like this. And she's like, that's normal. That's not normal. Like, this is fine. Oh, push through that. Um, you know, she has all this experience to draw off of to know like what I should and shouldn't be feeling. Because again, at the very beginning, I'm sitting here wondering like, if, is it possible to re-injure myself? And I was just left to wonder those things because of course the physical therapist, she has like a lifetime of experience, but she doesn't know exactly what went on. She's not a surgeon. Um, she's not my surgeon. And so she's like, you know, she has things where she's like, oh, we'll ask the ask the surgeon this when you do your next follow-up and go and, and um, maybe he can tell you that for this. And, and I keep trying to tell her that he doesn't communicate. He doesn't tell me anything and she doesn't believe me. I don't think even now she believes me. Um, but yeah, my one month and my six week follow-up were both with the surgeon and they were literally less than five minute appointments. He never touched the knee. He never saw it. I was never out of the brace that was locked straight. I would be like, oh, well, I still can't lift my leg. And he's like, yep, that's fine. And then would walk, you know, schedule an appointment in two more weeks. Um, and I'm like, I'm I'm trying to talk to you and, and it's just, it's just not happening. So yeah, I, I got to the point where I was six and seven weeks post-op and I still couldn't lift my leg. It was scary because I, I'm sitting here and I go, okay, flex my quad muscle and I go okay I can do that bad knee flex my quad muscle and it's not like it was weak and I'm like oh I'm trying I'm trying but I can't do it it's it was literally not there it was like that muscle did not exist in my leg for me to be able to try and flex it and that's scary like just knowing that it's neurological and it's like this pathway that my brain can't find to my own body and so it's very scary i'm like it, am i ever gonna rebuild this connection between my leg and my brain like why is why seven weeks later why am i still not able to access this my knee feels normal i'm laying here in bed or i'm sitting or whatever everything feels normal but i'm still on crutches and locked into a brace because without your quad muscle your leg will collapse I can't put weight on my leg because it will collapse. I had this moment um, where I was speaking with the physical therapist, like the doctor, not the assistant. 
And we realized like my exercises were getting easier, not because I was able to access my quad muscle, but because all of the other muscles were stepping in and taking action. They were going, oh, well, the quad muscle won't do it. So we'll step in and get stronger so you can do it. And like that was scary because I'm like, if these other muscles get used to doing the job instead of the quad, will the quad ever wake up? Will the quad ever decide like, hey, I need to be doing something? I've been really, really having a hard time struggling with like being depressed, thinking that like I did this to myself. This was an elective surgery. I, I went into this surgery so I wouldn't have to worry about my knees dislocating. I could be more active. I could work on projects. I could go backpacking you know, um, and here I am thinking like, did I do this to myself? Is it ever going to come back? What if it doesn't come back? Did, did I just like make my life worse? And not having anybody who can answer things. The physical therapists were just being really positive, being like, oh, it doesn't matter if it comes back or if it doesn't come back. We can teach it, you know, paralyzed people can learn to walk again. You don't need this muscle. We can get you walking even if even if it doesn't come back. And I'm like, that's not helpful. <laughs> I want to know that it's going to come back. And then talking to the doctor, you know, and the doctor's just like not talking to me and everything. So finally, I scheduled an appointment back with the physician's assistant. And that's the appointment I just had. And literally the day that I scheduled the appointment with the physician's assistant had a breakthrough at physical therapy. And we just did something a little bit different. And that little bit different thing was all my brain needed apparently to be like, oh, you have a quad muscle. It was like a light coming back on, you know, like, it, it was just crazy to feel like all of a sudden, hey, I have a muscle here and it's weak. I mean, I, I, that's why I'm not sitting like this and, and with, with both knees up and, and I still can't lift my leg and all that kind of stuff. It's weak. It, the muscle has deteriorated, but it's there and I can try to flex it. It's there. My brain can tell it try. Uh, whereas before, like there was nothing there. I couldn't even tell it to try to, to do something. So that was just a huge relief. I literally was like crying in the car afterwards, like, oh, thank goodness. So yeah, that's where I'm at with the surgery and where I'm at. Basically, I, I just have to rebuild the muscle. Um, I'm still working on range of motion. I can't bend my knee this much. My knee doesn't perfectly straighten out still. Um, but all those things are essentially like, it'll come and I feel a lot more comfortable about them. Like I, I'm not worried about it before I was worried because I was in physical therapy for so long and there was no results. But now I know that the, you know, exercise builds muscle. Like that's not something I have to see for myself. I know that that muscle will get stronger again. I just have to do my exercises and keep plugging along and, and doing my stretches and, and all that kind of stuff. And so I will get better at this point. I'm not worried that I'm not going to get better. Clearly, I'm not walking in a month because this is two months um, and I'm still on crutches in a locked brace. But I'm working really hard um, trying to get back to things because, yeah, the weather's beautiful. And I have these two projects that are huge projects that need done. And I am really tired of just sitting around doing nothing. I am one of those people uh, who can only watch so much TV. I mean, obviously I've been working through all of this, um, but there's a long story at work, but I, I can't tell you the long story. The short story at work is that I have changed roles at work twice this year, meaning I've had three distinct roles um, in this calendar year, which has just been nuts. And each time they kind of move my role around, I have this period of like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And um, so it actually kind of worked out really well that they switched the role right before I had this surgery. And so there was all this downtime right around the same time as the surgery. So I, I wasn't having to do a lot of work, but that's starting to ramp up now. But the other thing that I did is crochet. I kind of like piled up all the stuff that I've done here to showcase to you if you want to see what I've been working on. And the first thing, if you guys watched, it's a video called, um, keeping busy in bad weather or something and I unraveled a sweater that had gotten like sun bleached and I re a sweater vest out of it and um I added like this fake mohair and so it's actually really warm and I can't wear it 
<laughs> it's too warm of a sweater vest um, for me to wear. Brings me to the last thing. I'm getting ready to take a trip. Um, Cause if you follow me on Instagram, you probably saw a little while ago that my grandma passed away. And uh, so her funeral is coming up here soon. It's in Washington. So I am road tripping <laughs> on crutches with a bum knee and a dog uh, in my uh, electric vehicle. I'm not taking the van because I haven't put very many miles on the van in a while and I'm a little scared that I'm gonna find out something has gone wrong while it sat all summer. So I don't feel like the inaugural trip for the van should be this trip um, while I'm on crutches. If you don't know anything about the Chevy Bolts, they're like kind of the slowest charging electric vehicle there is on the market right now. Um, so every time I have to stop for a charge, it's like 40 minutes-ish. Um, and when you're going across the entire country, that adds up. So uh, it took my mom two days to get down in a regular Subaru, just a, a gas car. Estimating it might take me three days because of all the charging. And I'm broke. <laughs> I'm broke with all the surgery stuff. So I'm not doing hotels. I um, am gonna sleep in the uh, Bolt, the Chevy Bolt, which I have done before. I have the window screens, the blackout window screens already cut for it. Um, I showed all that off in my last video, which was my backpacking video. So I know I can do it, but yeah, that whole tangent came about from a sweater vest because yeah, I'm thinking about it. I got it out to show you guys and I think I'm gonna leave it out so I can wear it um up in Washington where it's like 50 degrees out um as a high we're still in the 80s as a high so I am going to be very cold in Washington but yeah that's that's the first thing I finished and then I was working on this sweater um that I haven't finished but uh you might have seen this yarn this was in a thrift haul that was in my Schooly Palooza video. And I'm making a raglan sweater out of it. And I wanted to do like a contrasting like baseball sleeve start sort of a sleeve. Um, but I'm having a hard time figuring out what yarn I wanna use for that. I ordered yarn and it was like bad. I didn't like it. So yeah, this is sitting at this point <laughs> like this waiting for sleeves. But I made these valances to go over my um, new front door, uh, the front door that has a window. Um, but this was the first project I've ever used, like that super tiny um, thread. Um, everything else I've ever crocheted has been with yarn. But it actually was like not that much harder um, working with this, the teeny tiny stitches and everything. So yeah, I made this little curtain, little valance. And then um, I have quite a collection of yarn, I think, as pretty much everybody who does any sort of fiber arts, you, you just somehow manage to have a bunch of yarn. So I was trying to like, um, you know, get through some yarn that I had and I had two skeins of the same yarn, different colors. And I just decided to do this little balaclava. It's from a pattern. Um, and I still had like half of the skeins left from this. And so I decided to make Teddy a little sweater and, um, yeah, he has a little matching sweater. So I can't wait to wear our little matching outfit. I don't think it'll be cold enough in Washington to wear the ball club, but I'm gonna take his sweater and I'll show you again. I'll add a clip of, of him in the sweater so you guys can see how cute it was. This I more or less made from just scratch, just just tried it on him a million times. He was so sick of me by the end of it, but I, I just tried it on a million times and kind of freehanded this. So I'm pretty proud that I was able to freehand something. Oh, I also forgot to show you guys this bag I made for my crutch. Um, yeah, it's this bag. And then I put this little front pocket on and it buttons on and it has been super helpful. It was not my idea. I saw it on Reddit and recreated it. Um, but I've gotten so many compliments on it um, from the doctors and everything when they see it. They're like, ah, oh, it's a genius idea. Um, and it is. I can't take credit for it, but it's still a genius idea. And then um, the project that I spent the most amount of time on uh, is also not finished because I ran out of yarn on it. And so uh, I had to put it down and I started working on the last project I'll show you. Um, but it's a cardigan. It's um, like kind of a vest at this point. So these are just granny squares and I have one side finished. Um, 
of the vest part, I have the other side still open, I ran out of yarn. And then I started making sleeves and realized that the sleeves were too small, so I needed a lot more yarn. So I need to make like 20 more squares, I think, to finish this. Um, and then when I have that finished, then um, I need to do obviously the ribbing all over everything. And then that will be done. So yeah, when I had ran out of yarn to finish that project, I picked up the blanket that I think you probably have seen draped over this couch that I started um, last winter. And then um, it got to the size where it needed to drape over me like a blanket for me to continue working on it. And then it got too hot. That's kind of cooled down a little bit now. And so I picked it back up and I've made a ton of project progress on it. I kind of honestly can't even probably lift it up enough to show you guys all of it but this is that's it um I threw a little stitch marker in here to show you guys so this is what I had done previously and then um this is how much I've done so I'm on row 191 out of 365 and I have some big chunks of color crossed out basically this is a temperature blanket and I decided I wanted to do a temperature blanket for the first year here at the homestead and the colors represent temperatures so I basically did um, hot to cold where hot is um, black dark brown and cold is gonna be white, which I don't have yet. I'm not to that part of the year yet where it was cold. But yeah, so basically this is April, you know, through, uh, what are we at, November. This is November. Each row is basically a day. I'm kind of doing this pretty abstractly um, because I, I did cut out a bunch of colors, like some stuff in here. For example, these big blocks were much bigger and I didn't want the blanket to be like 10 feet long. So I cut a little bit of um, length off of this so that it would be a better dimension and everything. I just got to the yellow color and I'm kind of having a crisis that I don't know whether the yellow really goes. I had that same moment with the red where I was like, oh, the red doesn't go, but now I really like the red. So I'm trying to figure out whether the yellow actually doesn't go or whether, um, I'm just having that same moment of like, oh, it's different and, and I don't, I don't like different. So you guys let me know whether you think the yellow works or not. Obviously it's, I'm going for like a very 70s theme. Um, this is the white, it's an off white. I mean, you know what white is, but like this is an off white um, to give you a better idea of how it works. I think the yellow will look a lot better once it's got the white in there to like balance it off. Cause right now the yellow is just like the only thing that's light on here. Um, and I think when it's, more of like this, you know, how there's no orange in this section. It's pretty much all um, red and brown. And there's gonna be a section in this blanket that's more or less all white and yellow. And I think it will balance out, but I don't know. And I don't wanna put a lot of time and effort into it without knowing. <laughs> so yeah, anyways, I am, um, I'm kind of struggling on, on what to do with this blanket, but. Yeah, that's what I've been doing. Nothing, nothing about the homestead, unfortunately. Um, I am so ready to get back to projects with the homestead. Um, and uh, you guys have been so sweet asking me where I am and when's the next video and all that kind of stuff. And I really wish I could tell you. Because <laughs> um, it's like I have to get healthy first and then I have to finish the project. And I don't know how long it's gonna take for me to get healthy. And then after after I am to the point where I can work on these projects again, I kind of can't tell you how long it's gonna take to do the projects. I hope I have another project video out before the end of the year. If you guys have any other types of videos you would like, let me know if you have any video ideas that I can do while I am on crutches still. I uh, appreciate that you guys are checking in with me and seeing how I am. Everybody who hopped over to Instagram and is messaging me on Instagram, I, I, I saw. I know I, a couple times I told people, you know, on the community posts and stuff that I'd be more active on Instagram and then a bunch of people would show up and, and message me and, and follow and everything. So I'm like, oh, hey, there's some YouTube people. Um, so that was pretty cool. So um, continue to do that if you want to see some more day-to-day -day stuff, you know, my trip to Washington, all that kind of stuff. I'll do some posts on Instagram and, and whatnot. Um, otherwise, that that's the update. I have no idea how long I've been talking, but I know it's a very long time. 
Um, so I apologize for the length of this video. Thank you guys so much for sticking around until this point. I can't imagine this is the first video you're seeing of me if you're watching this video. Um, but if it is, this isn't normal for me. You know, go check check out some older videos and see all what I'm all up to and what's going on out here in the desert. Um, but yeah, until next video, guys. Peace out.